Today, I'm speaking with Carrie Smith. And Carrie, you're the host of the Deprogrammed podcast. And uh, as I was just about to say to you before I hit record, this is a bit of a different uh, sort of a departure for me, because most of the people that I've spoken with have reached out to me to talk with me on this, um, whatever this is, this YouTube channel podcast yeah. thing. And uh, I actually reached out to you. So I'm really happy to be talking with you. You, uh, I found your podcast, Unsafe Space, that you were doing with Carter Laren at the time. Mm-hmm. And I guess, was it 2019 or 2020 when you guys were doing that? We started at the end of 2018. So okay. yeah, but we okay. were doing it up until uh, 2021, I believe, or 2022, 2021. Okay. Well, I found it. You guys were already underway. And, and so there had been, it was, it was somewhat established, but I found it when I was in graduate school and I was trying to figure out what the heck all this woke stuff was. I didn't have a language for it, really. I couldn't articulate what I was experiencing. And I just knew that there was something ideological that was happening that was changing the way people were talking and thinking. And it was like, it felt very, very totalizing and very strange to me. And I I had not experienced that really previously. Mm -hmm. And I found you guys about the same time I found Critical Therapy Antidote, which is a really, I don't know if you're aware of who they are, but I'm not, but that's a great name. Yeah. Yeah. It's a group that was founded by Val Thomas in the UK and another um, counselor who was in the US. And then it started to gather steam. Val wrote this wonderful piece for um, new discourses that I Mm -hmm. found. And it just really articulated what I was experiencing and why I thought it was so wrong in the therapy field. And I was a graduate student in mental health counseling at the time, but you and Carter also really helped to articulate that. And as I watched and listened to you guys, you went through the knitting thing that happened and with the knitting community. And a girlfriend of mine is a, uh, one of, she's my best friend, actually, she's a yarn dyer and she's an indie yarn dyer who was watching this happen also at the same time. And yeah. it was really, uh, it was profoundly helpful to have people dissecting this and actually describing what was going on. And I was really grateful for the work that you guys were doing. And so I'm excited to speak with you because I think that you have an, you have kind of a, an interesting perspective on it. And you kind of were an early comer to this awakening that a lot of people have been going through. So thank you so much for speaking with me today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. And I, it's funny. It takes me back to that time period you're talking about. And, and when you say early to an awakening, um, it makes it, it kind of, I, I necessarily have to contrast where we're at today and look at how much ground we've taken. Mm. I think yeah. people who are whatever you want to call us reality based, based. Mm. I heard that based came from reality based. So I like that, <laughs> but based people and, there are more people waking up all the time and it's not just, it's not people on the right. That's the, you know, the common misconception mm-hmm. is that, oh, this is a right left thing. It's not my, I, my husband is a musician and I got to go with him to some of his shows in Europe last year. We were there for five weeks. It was amazing. But um, Amsterdam in particular, I was a, a, sort of a, a reminder that I needed that base doesn't mean right, left, because even mm-hmm. we can get pulled into that dichotomy sometimes. And, you know, I met all these people in Amsterdam who are in this left, progressive, artist, hippie kind of community, musicians, artists, who are all based. Mm. And they're progressives, and mm. they're completely awake. They've they've had, for a lot of them, they woke up during COVID, the COVID restrictions in their country. But for others, it was um, seeing what's happening to the farmers there in the mm. Netherlands and, you know, that that was a a good reminder to me that you know even I sometimes can get sucked into this right left crap, and that's not what it is. And so I I love it when I meet people who are either still on the left or they're they're leaving the woke part of the left, but they're they're still progressives because I'm like yes, it's not a right left thing. You are mm-hmm. evidence. You yourself. You know, mm-hmm. it's just about being awake to the things that are happening in the world and the, this. In particular, this dangerous ideology that I used to be wrapped up in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, it it isn't a right left thing, and that's been an interesting process for me in engaging with this. This I don't know. It's a series of issues, so it's not just one issue, but I guess this whole cultural phenomenon 
uh, as I've been having these kind of public conversations, not kind of public conversations Mm -hmm. and getting the responses that I get, it's um, I would have always considered myself to be a liberal. I at one point would have considered myself to be very far left and did. And then I realized what that actually is and realized that, no, that doesn't represent me. And so when I made this channel, I named it the radical center because I, I it was kind that. of an ironic name because it shouldn't be radical to be in the center. But right now it feels that way because everything is pulling us to the polls so much. And as I've been doing these conversations and having these, a lot of the feedback I get does come from the right. And it's critical of the people who are um, speaking on this channel, uh, talking about their experiences, that they're lefties, that they're still stuck in a leftist paradigm or a liberal paradigm. And I have a lot of thoughts about that. For one thing, it's it's interesting that no matter which, if you try to stay in the center, you're misconstrued by both sides. Yes. And And the other thing is that I think that the most useful voices right now, to some extent, are not those that are that are validating the right, but those that are speaking to the people on the left who still have their eyes closed. Yes. And that's, that's kind of a, I went through, I I have my own channel now, T-programmed. I told you before, my husband made this sign, so I have to show it off. Awesome. (laughs) Um, But one of the things I try to do on this channel, and I have to remind myself of this periodically, um, is not just to talk to people who are awake to what's going on in the world mm-hmm. based in some way. Mm-hmm. And I use that term very broadly. Again, it can mean people, it can mean progressives. It can mean, it does invite on my, on my channel. It can mean people on the right. It can mean Christians, atheists, it's all kinds of people, but I would just say people who are reality based. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes I have to even remind myself of that and say, no, we're doing another episode about you know, this thing that seems very basic to people who are already awake, but it's not to people who are, who are still in my old ideology. So this week, this past week, for example, I did an episode about the difference between principles and ideology, like your founding, the founding principles, the foundational beliefs in a belief system versus the belief system itself. Because Mm -hmm. I think that's where If you can help people to see that, I try to think about what would have helped me when I was in that world. If you, if you can help people to untangle their thoughts and understand the difference between, um, a a fundamental truth that that's unwavering that you believe in no matter what, like don't lie, for example, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, versus a political ideology or a religious ideology or something and, and how it's important to keep those principles primary more important than the ideology. And mm-hmm. so um, I guess I'm kind of rambling now, but yeah, I, I try and I try and remember that. Like for me, when I, every once in a while to keep myself accountable, I'm like, why am I doing this again? What it, What is driving me and what is my goal? And my goal is to help people leave the left, the, leave the woke left, not the left and as a whole, but mm-hmm. the woke left, help people leave the cult that I was in, the cult of ideology I was in. And so I've gotten lots of messages from people who have left. I've also gotten messages, and I get these all the time from parents or um, boyfriends of you know someone who's started to get into woke. And so there's a lot of it seems to be a lot of people out there searching for information on you know what's that one magic video or mm-hmm. or article or book I can give to my loved one to help wake them up and the sad reality is I don't think there's one thing. So I just try and come at it from all angles and, and tear it apart as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's really easy when you start doing this. How long have you been doing your show? Um, uh, My first video was in October of 2023. Wait, 2022. Yeah. Oh, we just passed out of 2023. So it's been over a year. Let me cool. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. That's been a while. Yeah. I think you'll find uh, sometimes it can get easy. And I think do, people do get pulled into just doing like with any job or something where you just sort of are like, okay, this is what I do today. And I think sometimes I, I notice that people just start talking to people who are already in agreement with them. Mm-hmm. And it's great to acknowledge those people. I mean, we all have like regulars who show up and support mm-hmm. a channel and stuff. And, but I never want to just, I never want to forget who I'm really trying to reach mm-hmm. when I talk. 
and mm -hmm. I don't want to be cost too caustic because those people won't listen. I mean, on my video yesterday, I had to rein myself in because I wanted to say, how stupid are you? <laughs> but nobody's going to listen. Here, watch this video. It's going to help you wake up. And it's some lady going, you're stupid. <laughs> no, that's not going to help. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, that's a really good point. I mean, that's kind of exactly it. When the, when the, you hear the people who come from a more, they're more grounded in this. They've been, they've been, you know, it's interesting. Like I, I feel like this something I've I've said and I've thought is that I I was I'm older than a lot of the people who were indoctrinated into the woke ideology. So I missed out on that. I feel like there was a big gulf. I my last um educational foray prior to going back to graduate school had been in the early 2000s. So well, I 2010 I left a law school program and then I didn't go to school for nine years. And I went back to school into a graduate program in 2019. And I was like, wow, this is all different. You, this, this woke ideology was very blatant. It was very upfront and unabashed. And I'd been in a psychology undergrad, a clinical psych undergrad, where I'd taken some classes with the master's program prior. And this was totally different. It was a, com a complete focus on anti-racist ideology, on intersectionality, on the gender stuff in a way that I'd never heard before. And I did gender studies back in the day. I did like a psychology of gender course, which wasn't woke, you know? Wait, so when was that? What so, time period? Oh, that would have been, I graduated my undergrad in 2008. So it would wow. have been in the mid 2000s. Oh, wow. So I, that's weird because I was getting it and I graduated my undergrad in 2000. I'm older than so, you. So, you know, yeah, I don't, you're probably not because I was a later student. <laughs> I'm, oh, okay. I'm, I'm 47. No, 40. Yeah, I'm 47. I have to think about it. Um, I think I am too. No. You I, have to think I, about I, it I too. I joke because I have to think about it. I <laughs> yeah. think I'm 45. <laughs> okay. See? Yeah. yeah. So that, but that you're, that yeah. builds into my point really well because I feel like it wasn't woke. But then there are people who say they've been seeing this coming since the 70s. They've been seeing this coming. They definitely saw it in the 80s. They have this different perspective where they've watched this indoctrination happen. And they can point to things that I would have thought were perfectly normal in my own childhood, where I was actually being, from their perspective, indoctrinated into this in kind of a slow boil process. And so it's just some people feel like they're very steeped in this and very aware of it and very grounded in this. And they're impatient with other people who haven't seen it yet. And I, and I think that that's kind of the thing that you're, you're speaking to really well. It's easy for those of us who feel confident in our, I guess, viewpoint on this to be sort of self-congratulatory and frustrated with other people who are still perpetuating the process. And like you said, it's not helpful, not necessarily helpful. It's if what you're helpful. trying to do is talk to them. And I encountered this, way i mean at the beginning when i first started on my old show this attitude from some people and i never got it i talked about it then i'm like there some people have an attitude of um you know you're late to the party mm -hmm. like i was at the party mm -hmm. back in 8 1980 or whatever <laughs> you know they're just they're so hostile to new people showing up to the party mm -hmm. and and I imagine they're the type, I'm using a party analogy because I imagine they're the type that would do that at a real dinner party. If you get there late, they're like, you're late. You can't come in or whatever. You know, it's like, yeah. I'm just like, come to the party. I yeah. don't care what time you get here. Yeah. And, and it, for me, I think it's, when I look at that, it's a really dangerous human. It's, it's one of the dark sides of human nature to be, um, to be, just, just unkind to people because they didn't figure something out as soon as you did. And it's also, it's got so much resentment in it. It's got so much arrogance in it. It has so much, um, just all the things I hate. It's, it, it's got that sort of, um, like for me, it, it, it belies that your, your true goals are not actually waking people up. Mm -hmm. You may, they may have started off and that's what you wanted to do is to help people see your point of view and to help mm -hmm. people come around to your point of view. Maybe that's how you started. Right. Mm -hmm. But at some point, something else became more important to you without you realizing it. And, mm -hmm. and I would say that that's your ego, mm -hmm. your fragile ego, like some sort of fragile narcissism, that sort of, um, but I got here first and I need to be acknowledged mm -hmm. and I need to be, uh, you know, 
people need to worship me or really listen to me or really pay attention to me because I figured this out way before they did. And it's, mm -hmm. I just, I can't stand anything about that because it turns people off. And, and it's not just in the based world. I've seen that in other, other belief systems or other, you know, communities, whatever you want to call it. I've seen mm -hmm. some people cling to be Christians who are like that, who are mm -hmm. so unkind and so mm -hmm judgmental and almost resentful of new Christians, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, I've known Jesus for my whole life. You just, you know, it's like, oh gosh, what are you doing? You're turning, you're not, well, you're not living it very well. And, and, and the same with, with us, you know, so-called anti-woke or base people. If you're like that, if you're just turning people away, it's like, what is, what's your point even? Mm -hmm. You're a great recruiter for the other side. Mm -hmm. You're a great recruiter for saying, you know, kicking people out and kicking them over to some place that will actually that will accept them, actually accept them or welcome them. You know, it's, I, I, it's, it's counterintuitive to me. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. um, no, it so, sort of ties right back into what you were saying about values versus ideology. And I think that yeah. that's something that when I, when I think about that, I think of process versus content or form versus substance. And like, what is, what is, for instance, with, with the woke stuff, with anti-racism, the, the content is we're concerned about different treatment and outcomes for different racial groups. We're concerned about racial disparity and we don't think that's right. We're, we want people to have better opportunities across racial categories. Maybe, maybe that's the content we could just, if we're being really charitable right. and reading them in the most um, gentle way possible, but then the process that they use in order to enforce this, this anti-racist ideology, which says, uh, I don't like that you treat people badly based on race because that that belies the content of their humanity. So we're going to treat you differently based on race and ignore the content of your humanity. It becomes yes. this really like snake eating its tail sort of process that undermines the content. Absolutely. If we're going to get into, yeah, fundamentally what's wrong with woke or social justice and mm -hmm. That's one of the most basic things is that it it doesn't even abide by its own stated principles. Mm -hmm. So as an ideology, as a belief system, it does have these stated, you know, tenets of belief, these stated principles. And and one of them, which is a good one to have, is racism is wrong. Mm -hmm. It's wrong to treat people differently on the basis of race. We want to end racism. That's how they get a lot of well-meaning people attracted to it. People who want to do good, especially young women get pulled into it because they want to do good and they believe it's what it says it is. Like this mm -hmm. is about ending racism or sexism or homophobia, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But then it tells you, and th this is where principles are, is so important because if, if you don't have a principle, you'll go wherever the ideology pushes you. And so then it tells you, okay, now in order to do that, in order to end racism, in order to stop treating people differently on the basis of race, we're going to have to treat people differently on the basis of race for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but don't worry. And this is where the cult programming comes in. Don't worry. It's not racism because we've redefined racism. Here's the new definition. So technically you don't have to worry because this is just prejudice. It's not prejudice plus power. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to do this and this is going to, it's for a good end goal of ending racism right now. If you don't have that principle already laid out in your life where, where you say, no, this is inflexible. I, you don't treat people differently on the basis of race. That's wrong. If you don't have that principle, you'll go where the ideology pulls you. And if it pulls you to a place that turns you into, which which woke or social justice, whatever you want to call it, does, it pulls you to a place where it gets you to behave in exactly the opposite way of what it is you think you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's why I call it evil, because it takes these well-intentioned people, a lot of times young people or young women, and it turns them into fit soldiers for the very thing they think they're fighting. Mm -hmm. How evil is that? Mm -hmm. You're out there in the street. Some of these, sometimes I look at, you know, young people at these, um, at any kind of woke protest, really around any of these identity categories. And I know that they think they're doing good. They think they're out there doing good. I'm out here ending racism or sexism or homophobia. Right. And it's like, how evil is it that that person is a puppet for the very thing they think they're opposing? Wow. Yeah, it really is. That's really a good point. And I think it's easy to forget because I think that this, this process of anger and resentment, it breeds 
more of itself. And as you see somebody who's like the classic libs of TikTok video of this person who's just belligerently, smugly, arrogantly pushing something that you think is false and stupid on the viewer, it it breeds that same response in the viewer. And it oh, becomes yeah. this like feeding frenzy, yes. it feels like. The anger just begets more anger. And so it's hard to remember that sometimes, to remember to look at them as just people who are really have gotten into this because they wanted to uphold something that they thought was important. Right. Well, since you mentioned that kind of person, like mm-hmm. on Lives of TikTok, the kind that we often see is belligerent and angry. And I've seen this people in real life at protests. Mm-hmm. I will add this caveat. I don't think everyone in social justice or woke has good intentions or is a mm-hmm. good person mm-hmm. or, you know, mm-hmm. however you want to phrase it. I remember watching this video of Brett Weinstein's early on. It was maybe 2017 or 18. It was around the time I was starting to leave the woke world and figure things out. Mm. And it was called um, something about the magic trick was the name of it. It's been a while since I've watched it. But in it, he talked about the two different kinds of... I don't think he used the term social justice warrior. Maybe he did, but I viewed it as that's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. The two different kinds of personalities or people in this sort of movement of Mm -hmm. a bad ideology. Mm -hmm. And he said, there's, there are the useful tools. um, And then there are the bad actors and the useful tools, the way I view it, they're, they're the naive people. They are often well-intentioned. Um, they can start to go bad. The longer you're in a bad ideology, you can just become a bad actor. You can, because mm-hmm. I think it changes you in as a person mm-hmm. over time. But there are people in it who are useful tools. And I do think of those people as naive and mm-hmm. well-intentioned. And those are the people I try to reach. Mm-hmm. The bad actors, they know what it is. And, and they don't actually, they're not, they're not in it because they sincerely believe that this ideology is going to end racism and sexism. And they, want to do good like no they're in it because they want power money or fame Mm -hmm. um they're using it they know exactly what it is or they don't care they don't care Mm -hmm. about ending oppression they just want to be the ones oppressing Mm -hmm. you know they're they're eaten up by resentment and so those kind of people i also heard early on jordan peterson refer to them as being possessed by Mm -hmm. ideology Mm -hmm. and that really struck something in me because i've seen some of these encountered some of these people at protests and they, they do seem to be possessed um by something even mm-hmm. if it's just animus it's just this hatred but mm-hmm. those people i don't i don't tr- i don't worry about i don't try to convert and like lives a tiktok i will sometimes use different tools for different things i will use mockery when it comes to those people <laughs> because it's about showing them to be buffoons mm-hmm to the useful tools, to Mm -hmm. the ones who are well-intentioned. It's about exposing the bad actors and the bad, the, the evil parts of the ideology to the useful tools. And so I think those people are, I just interact with them differently. Mm -hmm. Um, And one thing I struggle to do, like you said, is if you're at a protest and someone's like that in your face, is to not let them pull that out of you too, because they have so much hatred for you. Mm -hmm. And so I just try and stay even killed and mm-hmm. loving and happy like mm-hmm. and if i get to a point at a protest where <clears throat> i can tell i'm getting angry mm-hmm. i leave that's what i do now because i'm like i'm not going to stay here if i'm getting angry because i don't you know most of the time i can stay for a while like there was one in georgetown texas anyway i stayed for a while they were being really hateful and you know sarcastic and horrible and uh i maintained my good cheer for for a while but after a couple hours i said okay i gotta go home because i'm getting really angry at this one person <laughs> so. i can't even imagine going to a protest up here i think i would be so outnumbered that it would be scary <laughs> I live near seattle and it just the 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 smug confidence of this kind of ideology yes. up here is so pervasive i yes. would be terrified to go to a protest up here a woke protest you know what's funny about being cheerful, though, if you go to one of these things like this? There are a few of them that you can kind of uh, break through that exterior 
mask that they're wearing or that possession or that hatefulness. Mm -hmm. It's rare. Hmm. But I'm thinking of the Georgetown one, for example. Yes, there were lots of people who just, no matter what I did, you know, or said, they hated my guts. But there was one pretty loud, um, woke, you know, protester, just the typical kind you would see on Libs of TikTok. And she had these cool American flag shorts. And I was like, oh, I like your shorts. Because the, what they're doing in Georgetown is, they're trying to reclaim the woke or trying to reclaim the word patriot. Mm. Okay. Interesting. Funny. Yeah. So they actually, they're unlike the woke in some other places in that they love to wear American flags because they oh. are trying to say, you know, we're the real patriots. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she had these American flag um, shorts on and I just was talking to her about them and we started, we started talking about, because everywhere I would move with my sign, she would move in front of me and try to block me and was just screaming at me. And so I would, and so I just started doing a little dance to see if she would do it. Like, okay, I'm over here and now I'm over here. And, and she kind of laughed and she was, it, it, and we just had that moment and I broke through, I said something about her shorts. And then I said something about, I started talking about Pee Wee Herman. I don't know why. And she was laughing and we actually had this weird kind of moment. And I ended up telling her, like, I would sit down with you and have a coffee mm -hmm. anytime. I think we would like each other more than we hate each other. And she's like, oh, I don't know, but, but I could see part of her was like, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> Like, and that was fun. I'm sorry I'm rambling too much. No, it's great. I'm going to let you ask me questions. I'm just going on a tangent about <laughs> no. protests. But that's fun. You can sometimes do, you can sometimes get past that mm -hmm. craziness and have a human moment with someone. Mm. No, that's really, that's really, you know, you said something early on in this conversation that sounded really optimistic. And I kind of wanted to ask you that close to the end, but you know, I, I'm just, you seem really optimistic. Are you, or do you just yeah. find a, the positive in things? Well, after I left woke, um, actually your husband was the first person who really ever asked me about my experience with God or becoming a Christian. And that was very new for me to talk about at the time. Um, but, but yeah, I became a Christian and I had I'm, I know I always hesitate because I'm like, ah, oh, I know if I'm get, some people are going to hear what I'm saying and think, God, what a weirdo. She's just joined another cult. I get that all the time. I know it. It's okay. I'm going to say it anyway. God changed my whole life, like my whole life, my whole way of looking at the world. I uh, just in terms of how I live, it's, it's so different than who I was. It's not just that I left social justice ideology. It's, it's that I learned, I learned how to think better. I learned how to behave better because ideology is not just a belief system. It's a behavior system. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, my husband and I got sober four years ago. Um, I, I've changed my opinion on so many things, uh, not just political things, but personal things about how to live your life. And I don't view the world in the same way. And I, a part of that is, yeah, I have a belief that God can use everything for good. There's a verse like that in Genesis and, and I've seen that happen. I've seen, I've had too many experiences where God has shown me something to be true, something that I doubted. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've seen that in my personal life examples where something horrible can still be used for good. And, um, and I believe I know you know, who is the alpha and the omega? Mm -hmm. I believe I know how things will end. And, and so I guess that's part of my optimism. I also, because I don't put a lot of faith in, I put faith in God. I don't put a lot of faith in the world, like uh, p politics, for example, a lot of people seem to put their faith just in, you know, like the presidential election is the beat. We got to do this. And I'm, I just don't think it matters that much. I really don't, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I do have I do have more um, faith in local politics. I think it's very important to be involved in local politics and your children's school board and you know things that directly affect you um, locally. But in terms of saving the country or or ending this ideology, I don't think it's a it is a political war, but it's not primarily a political war. 
And I, I, I started off when I was looking at all this, I'm like, it's a cultural war, like a lot of people say, mm -hmm. right? Okay, this mm -hmm. is about culture. And it is. But over time, I started to see it as a spiritual war. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that we defeat it um, with politics. The, you know, if we just get the right politicians in there, that can help. <laughs> but that's not how you change people's hearts. And so mm -hmm. it's funny, Leslie, I had a Peter Bogosian interviewed me. He he's, he's trying, he's an atheist, you know, mm -hmm. and he's trying to figure out how to wake people up on a mass scale, mm -hmm. like get people to leave this ideology on a big scale. Mm -hmm. And I hope he figures it out. I think he's brilliant. I hope somebody figures that out. I just don't know if that's possible. Cause I think it's, like any anything that spreads joy is contagious social justice ideology misery is contagious any it's going to spread person to person and so it just matters how how you live your life mm -hmm. and how the, like the people you come i know it sounds so cheesy but it's true the people you come into contact with what do you leave them with like what lasting impression mm -hmm. and how you behaved how you treated them a lot of times in my real life, outside of the podcast, I don't necessarily talk about this stuff right off the bat unless it comes up. And, you know, I have friends or people I've met who who are in the social justice world or were in it. Mm -hmm. And when they found out what I do, it's really um, a mind twist for them because mm. I knew they were woke the whole time, but I never treated them poorly. And then it's like gets them to open their mind a little bit to like, because they like me already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, you know what I mean? It's sort of like, because I didn't treat them like they're the enemy. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know if that makes sense. It Maybe makes a lot me. of sense. Yeah. And I don't think it's cheesy at all. I think it's really important. It's like these, these are so, there's such totalizing ways of thinking the woke, the anti-woke, you know, it's just... But it's not the most important or interesting thing about a person. There's no. so much more. And I think that's part of the illusion is that it becomes so all encompassing for some people and this political divide that's happening and this political veil that's been put over everything makes it seem as this as though those are the most important things about us. But yes. it's really, really not. It's not. And 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 if you go out in the world with the assumption that you can't change anybody's mind. Yeah, there's some people, like I said, those that are far gone, the bad actors, I don't worry about them. Mm -hmm. But there's so many who are not like that. And and if you go out with the assumption that they're all bad actors, like you're not going to have an impact at all because you're mm -hmm. going to be cutting people off. You're not going to treat them well. And, and you're not going to have an impact in the one place you can, which is your sphere of influence is the people you interact with every day. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, this, I'll tell you one anecdote because this might inspire people. There's a a woman, there's many, but there's one who comes to mind. She's an old school leftist, an old school boomer, hippie, mm -hmm. liberal. Okay. And I think the, like a lot of people in her age, she's gone along with woke, but not understanding what it is. And that's what the young people are, who are on the left are pushing. And they just kind of ride along with the cultural mm -hmm. wave like mm -hmm. they go where the culture takes them and she for a while um would would say things to my husband um you know well like after after she met me well we know carrie's crazy but you know like she just couldn't figure me out she thought mm -hmm. i was a right winger she thought you know but we would go to dinner parties with her and other music events and things. And it was like, I never treated her differently, even though I knew she had this view that I was some crazy right winger and dangerous or something. And, you know, invite her into my home and just always treat her with love. And then one day, one of the last people I would expect, she's at my house and we're having an event and she says, I need to talk to you. Can you come outside? And pulls me on the porch and she's like, I just read this book that I totally understand what you're talking about now. Oh, wow. I get it. She's <laughs> like, I understand now how DEI is doing the opposite of what it says. This isn't liberalism. And and I'm like, what book is this? I didn't <laughs> give this to people. <laughs> but but it, it was just, you know, maybe I planted the seed 
And then when she read that book, it's it's always, you know, multiple impressions that a person gets that can ch- that will change their mind. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so maybe I helped plant a seed with her by not being a dick to her because mm-hmm. she's mm-hmm. she's woke and that helped her to open her eyes to something later. And I didn't even really even talk about this stuff with her too in depth once in a while, you know, Mm -hmm. but I feel like I've, I've, I felt like I've been rambling a lot, Leslie. No, not at all. I think that's a, I'm, I'm, I think that there's a really good point that you're making about planting seeds and about just being open and not, it sounds like you're not trying too hard to influence her. You're just being yourself. You're not pushing your ideology or your way of thinking on this person, but you're being open about who you are and leaving space for her to be who she is. And then if what you're doing is more, it has more truth in it, then eventually she will come around to that. Yes. You phrased it great and very succinctly better than I did. I want to know what book it was too. Oh, (laughs) do you know? Do you have a quick second? Yeah, sure. Um, so last night I updated my phone and I lost all my messages, but they're here on my oh. computer. So let me find it real quick. Cause I just recently, somebody, I told this story to someone and they were like, what's the book? No. Oh, yeah. Um, hold on. Well, what you're saying about that, it's not one. What did you say earlier? You were talking about your own experience and how people, people reach out to you and say, how did you do it? How, what can I do that? My girlfriend, my kid, my, my so-and-so is, is into this. How do I deprogram them? And you say, there's not like one magic bullet. It's a, it's a process and it's going to be different for everybody, but there are, I, I know that there are resources that are helpful and probably a variety of different ones for different people. Yes. It's it's here. I'm looking for it. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm also listening. There are a variety of places. I think. I think for me, see, but I had already my mind had already been opened when I read this, but it still helped. Two of the books that helped me immensely. Um, one was The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt, mm-hmm. and I think that one's a good one to give to people because it's not overtly about social justice and woke it's about mm-hmm. it's about morality and and actually the subtitle is why good people are divided on politics and religion mm-hmm. but it helped for me it helped me to humanize conservatives or people on the right mm-hmm. which is desperately needed when you're in a cult and you see the other side as mm-hmm. inhuman so that was a important first step um yeah when you made the point about the ego taking over for people who are bashing others for being late to the party on the Mm -hmm. one side. And then on the other side, the bad actor who is driven by a desire to have power over or influence it. You know, you're talking about kind of these two different sides of the equation, but it's the same process. It's the same process of smug, arrogant disdain and self-righteousness. Yes. That doesn't, that's never going to win people. Why would anyone want to come over to that point of view? If you're smug, it's almost like, um, I'm, I'm fortunate that I have a lot of friends who are atheists who are very open-minded and tolerate my Jesus talk. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but I also have encountered a very specific type of atheist and it's not just atheists. Again, this is a character flaw that is seen in all kinds of people. But when it's seen in atheists, um, it's that very smug, judgmental, um, arrogant, condescending kind of approach that some, Mm -hmm. whenever I encounter that kind of atheist, I'm like, I don't, I don't have time. I don't have time for you. I really don't because we're never going to be able to have a conversation because you can't let go of that to to talk with me. You're always talking from this assumed intellectual high horse looking down at me and being a jerk and and I just, I can't interact. And and what I say to them sometimes is like, why would you think this would ever convince me to give up joy? my Like God, to give up everything I've gained with God to come over to your point of view so I can be some pseudo intellectual, arrogant, smarmy, you know, sarcastic, hateful, miserable person. You're not advertising your lack of belief very well. 
you know, <laughs> and it's the same with some anti woke people or some Christians or some whatever. It's like, how are you actually living out what you believe? If people interact with you, do they come away going, wow, that person's, I, I would really like some of what they've got, or do mm -hmm. they come away going, oh God, I never want to be like that person. <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> like, like get away from me. Um, I just so. read this, this, uh, for, uh, I saw this sign, this equity and inclusion sign at my grocery store yesterday. And I read this, I, it had the word bigot. It says, uh, this store does not tolerate bigoted behavior within our community. And it's this whole like DEI statement at a grocery store. So I, I look up the word bigot so that I can call their corporate office. And this is the, the, the dictionary definition of bigot. It's a person who is obstinately or unreasonably attached to a belief, opinion, or faction, especially one who is prejudiced against or an antagonist towards a person or people on the basis of their membership of a, of a particular group. Yes. And that is so representative of so much of the way people are thinking right now. Yes. And the woke stuff is just bigotry. Yes, absolutely. That's what the word really means. I mean, we've come to associate it so much with race but mm -hmm. it's actually about any group membership. Mm -hmm. Early on when I started leaving the woke world, obviously like a lot of people do, I lost a lot of friends, so-called mm -hmm. friends. And mm -hmm. um, I remember one of my friends at the time, very smart guy, um, but he, he had started being pulled into the woke world around the time I was leaving in around 2017. And he just started sending me all of this very bigoted, hateful stuff about Trump supporters and other, because at the time I was trying to figure out why Trump won. Um, this was, this started in around 2017 after the election. Um, I was still like thinking Trump was terrible, but I wanted to understand why he won. Mm -hmm. And even just asking questions about that, I got a lot of uh, pushback from people in my woke world. And so he was one of those and he sent me all the stuff that was incredibly bigoted. And I, I remember mm -hmm. saying that to him, like, this is, this is what bigotry is. Like if you cut off your family member, if you cut off your mom mm -hmm. only because she voted for Trump, like something's wrong with you. Like there, you have an, 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 an incredible amount of bigotry if that's the only mm -hmm. reason. And I think for some people, like it doesn't strike them as weird. You can't tell when you're in a cult, of course, you know, mm -hmm. when you're in it. Yeah. The Have you spot. seen any of the recent cult documentaries uh, uh, on Netflix? No. Okay. No. Let me do some recommendations for okay. you. Okay. Now, these are not about woke, but just, you know, any <laughs> it's cult a process. documentary. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, there's one about the uh, true love, uh, Twin Flame, the Twin Flame cult. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting which is insane. And if, and there's one about, um, mother God, the cult of mother God. Okay. Now, when you watch these, these are microcosms of what's happening on a societal level. And when you watch this, you're, you're wondering how can these people get so far in that they don't see how crazy this is, what mm -hmm. they're being asked to do now, what they're participating in now, the kind of abuse they're taking now, why can't they see it? Mm -hmm. And it's because they get into it by degrees. And just like on a societal level with social justice, we look at some of the stuff that's happening now. And if you're on the outside, if you're based and you're looking mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. you're thinking, how can people seriously go around saying there's no such thing as biological sex? That's crazy. But they got into it by degrees. Mm -hmm. So I think watching, I watch a lot of cult documentaries because it helps me understand things mm -hmm. about human nature, about cult beliefs, about bigotry. Mm -hmm. about the insider and the outsider and all of that. Um, I found the name of the book. Do you want this? Yes, I do. Okay. Now I haven't read this. This is just the one that my friend this said. This is the one that helped her. Yes. I want to read it because if it's, if it did this for her, um, it's called what's our problem by Tim Urban. Mm, okay. I have and not I think, heard of it. I think he's a liberal. And so since she enjoyed it so much, I think it would be a good, recommendation possibly for people who are in that world who will only listen to a liberal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah know. and there are a lot of them a lot yeah. of people who won't they're they won't break out of that echo chamber 
Yeah. I made this joke. I've, I've said this before. I said this on a solid ground live stream. I do this live stream every Monday with some colleagues and, uh, this is quite a confession. It'll probably piss people off, but, um, I made this joke. I was new to living in Seattle. I had moved up here partly to escape what felt like a very um, oppressive political ideology in San Antonio, where I lived before. It was, uh, it was, I was involved in some environmental work, some environmental um, activism around the aquifer, the Edwards Aquifer which you're probably familiar with if you live in South Texas. I'm actually not. Okay. It's a karst aquifer underground system that provides all the drinking water for San Antonio and the surrounding area. And it has, there's a lot, or at least there used to be, I don't, I have stayed, I don't know anything about local politics down there right now, but when I was there, developers were always trying to develop in the hill country, which was right over top of the aquifer recharge zone. And so if you put a bunch of impervious cover over the aquifer recharge zone, you reduce the amount of rainfall that can get down in and, and recharge the aquifer. And so you end up with a crisis of, of drinking water and people are water rationing down there all the time. Um, the it's also, it's not just impervious cover, but it's also VOCs coming from these big parking lots where, and golf courses that uh-huh. they're putting over top of this, where the runoff goes into your drinking water, because this is just a limestone filtration, natural filtration system. So this was a big, I, you know, we're, we're getting really granular about something that only matters in one particular place in the world, but um, it mattered a lot to me. And I felt really frustrated with local politics and it felt like a very... Um, there were, there was a lot more to it. I also hated the heat of Texas. I moved to get away from the heat, but uh, (laughs) understood. So yeah, it (laughs) it was a, I felt like I was a climate refugee, but I also felt really smugly leftist and very, Mm. um, very, you know, frustrated with the, the attitude that we don't have to recycle and we don't have to, we can throw things out the window. We just, there was this, it, it felt like an oppressive, what I would have called at the time conservative mindset, which now I see differently. I don't see it the same way that I did, but I said at a dinner party when I was new to Seattle and I was hanging out with some people who all, you know, we were in our little smug bubble. I said something like, um, Democrats, oh wait, was Republicans think Democrats have bad ideas, but Democrats think Republicans are bad people because they are. Uh... This was my joke. And, and it was like, ha ha. I'm so, I'm so smug. I, I know better. Yeah. And there was there. And it's funny, my best friend that I already referenced, who is a, uh, Indy yarn dyer. She's, she, we've been best friends since I was 21 and she was 25 or 26. And we were new moms together. And she has always been a conservative Christian. And I was always this, I was agnostic. I didn't grow up with religion and I was, a a bigoted Democrat. And yet we were still best friends. We just had this area. Wow. We couldn't talk about this one thing. If we did, we started to be, you know, give each other little, little daggers, but we just set that aside. And, and she tolerated my bigotry and I tolerated hers because it was kind of the same way. We both had our minds closed on this, but, but I definitely had one way of thinking about things for a long time. And I didn't take a lot of influence from people who thought differently than me. You, you and your friend, that's so rare and that's so important and people have forgotten how to do that. Mm -hmm. And you just made me think of, um, there's another book I read called Love Your Enemies. It's a great book. Um, Blanking on the Kennedy, I think is the guy who wrote it. I forget his first name, but, um, that book is where I learned about Aristotle's three types of friendships. Mm. And you have the, that's the third type of friendship, the the character base. It's because your friends, even despite huge differences in maybe the way you view the world, Mm -hmm. but you love each other's character Mm -hmm. and it's the most pure kind of friendship, Mm -hmm. like add the three, according to Aristotle, you know, there's the three different kinds, but that one's really rare. I think we don't know in how to make those kind of friends as easily maybe as we used to as a, as a country. I want to look that up. Aristotle's three kinds of friends. I don't, I'm going to make a note. Um, I am glad that you brought up religion. 
can't write and think at the same time. Um, I, I am glad you brought that up because I, I think that's something that a, a lot more people are finding a need for spirituality and in, in their lives. And I think that you're right in that this is a spiritual, if you want to call it a war, it's the spiritual crisis, Battle. if crisis. if nothing else. And the idea of spirituality is just it's just the conviction that there's some value to life that transcends the material, that yes. there's something more to us than just the material form. And, yes. and I, I think that um, for me, I, I never thought of myself as an atheist, but I was probably closer to that than I ever was to religious as a kid. Growing up, I went to um, church with friends sometimes, and I felt that Christian bigotry that you talked about, that really, uh, that I was going to hell if I didn't say the right words. You just have to say these magic words, and then you're like, you're you're allowed to be a good person. But if you don't say the right, it's not really about your convictions. It's just about making the right sounds and doing the right rituals. And that it just, it felt again, oppressively stupid to me at the yeah, time. It, it is felt, that, yeah. well, that is oppressively stupid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think. Yeah. And, and so it was, for me, it was, um, when I went to university, I was a little bit older. I was in my like mid to late twenties and I went to a Catholic university and I had to take a bunch of Catholic education courses as a part of my core, um, just in order to go there. And I read the New Testament for the first time. And so this is when I was first actually engaging with the teachings of Christ. And so it really changed my perspective on Christianity. It made me see that there's two different ways to view it. You can be, it's kind of, it's, it's, it goes right back to what you talked about in the very beginning. I feel like this theme is really strong throughout this whole conversation about the ideology or the principles. Yes. Yeah. People can lose sight of of founded of the foundational principles of their belief system and any belief system, or maybe they never had them. Mm -hmm. And that that's true for, I mean, I was similar to you, uh, maybe more prejudiced against Christians than you were. I don't know, but I was very prejudiced against Christians for a long time. And a lot of that had to do with the representations of Christianity that I got, that I received from the world, from pop culture, from culture, you know, and a lot of it are, um, of course, going to be the con artists, the bad actors within Christianity. Like in any ideology, you're going to get any belief system where there are people who have sincere belief, you're going to get predators who show up to take advantage of that belief and use that belief and speak that belief back to people to get their money, to get fame, to get power. And in the Christian world, you know, I was growing up, uh, we were growing up on the same time. So I was seeing all of these hypocrites, mm -hmm. these charlatans, mm -hmm. these wolves in shepherd's clothing representing Christianity to me on the television screen. And I was really, it really inoculated me against it. Mm -hmm. I really thought of it as this hypocritical, backwards, authoritarian, you know, belief system. But I didn't know God. I was looking at these people who claim to be representing God. Um, and now I've come to understand, this is why, Leslie, probably nothing makes me as angry. <laughs> Even the woke don't make me as angry as um, as people who, uh, predators, con artists who use God as a cloak, mm. like who use Christianity as a cloak to do their predating on people um jesus had the utmost anger for these people as well that's why i feel like maybe my anger is okay <laughs> at some point i might need to get work on it a little bit but look jesus was angry too but he really he did he had so much anger he called them whitewashed tombs he said he said it would be better for these these false prophets these false shepherds um those that would lead little ones astray, that it would be better for them to have a millstone tied around their neck and be thrown into the sea mm. than what awaits them. Like that is some serious, like, mm. you know, what awaits you for doing that, for using God's name to deceive people and to gain um, 
power, fame, money, like what awaits you is so much worse than being drowned with a rock around your neck. Like, so I think it's a real shame. Uh, I do have a point here, which is that, <laughs> yeah, I think my, my pastor, I go to, um, I go to this great church. I, I can't believe that this pastor happened to be in my little town. Mm -hmm. I found him at the right moment. If I was looking for a church during the lockdowns and their first service was during the lockdowns. And I'm like, who is this? I found a Facebook ad, right? And it was, I could walk to the church at that time. I'm like, I can't believe this. I go there and he's brilliant. My pastor's um, Bradley Helgerson. He's like C.S. Lewis meets Jordan Peterson is the way I describe him. And from that first sermon, I'm like, this is, it's like the love of God, but also he's making me think in every sermon. It's like a, a, a interesting lecture. And, um, and, and so it, that one of the things he talked about early on that I'd never heard articulated like this before was he was saying our modern culture inoculates people against God, against the good word, against mm. Jesus. And, and I came to see, yes, that's exactly what happened to me. Like I, mm. I wouldn't even consider it. And when, and when I was in my darkest moments, I was, I was willing, I basically got to a place where I had considered and tried everything except for God. Mm -hmm. And that was the one thing that helped me, but I wouldn't, I personally, I'm so stubborn. I wouldn't even open my mind to the possibility of there being a God. I was so inoculated against it. I was so like, oh, I know what that is and I'm writing it off, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what it was. And, you know, it took great humbling. It took me getting to the lowest place possible. That's when you have that opportunity to either humble yourself or just, I guess, go further down. Um, and and it 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 took that humbling for me to even start asking those questions. My first questions are what you just said, the way you you voiced the definition of spirituality. Mm -hmm. My very basic question was, I became obsessed with needing to know, are we really just physical bodies with computer brains and that's it? And mm -hmm. there's nothing else more meaningful. We just happen to be it's just like an accident that this is all or is there something more eternal in us? Is there something called the soul or mm -hmm. um, what, you know, scientists try to define consciousness. And it, it, sometimes I've heard people say, well, they get, they hit this wall and that's where it's, they can't, they can't really explain. I started reading about string theory and stuff. I was like, I don't, I'm trying to understand this. What is consciousness? But I, I really was obsessed with, with figuring out if, if we, if there's something, if we have a soul, there's mm -hmm. something in us that's more than just the material world. And um, that's what opened the door for me to something I had never considered and been, and been totally prejudiced against, mm. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Uh, are you, where are you asking those questions now? Like, where were you, where are you at now? Are you open to the possibility or sort of like agnostic or? Um, no, well, I, I am not, I don't think that I'm a Christian per se. I don't, I, I, my mom used to have this way of talking about this where she talked about big C Christians and little C Christians. This was mm -hmm. her kind of paradigm in her mind. So the big C Christian would have been the church going. I, um, I follow the, the doctrines of the Christian faith and the little C Christian would have been the person who tries to follow Christ's teachings. And so I would consider myself to be a little, little C Christian in that, in my mom's paradigm, but I am not, um, I, I had a series of, of spiritual experiences that happened to me in the year 2022. Um, and the final one, then this is weird to talk about. I've, I've talked about these a little bit, but not, a whole, I don't think I've ever talked about them on my YouTube channel. Uh, I don't think maybe I have maybe a little bit. Uh, Benjamin asked me about this one time in an inter interview and we're on his channel. And I just like choked, like, I don't know how to talk about this. People are going to think I'm crazy. <laughs> same, but, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I had this experience where I woke up from a nap and I was in this full blown religious spiritual experience. I I don't know how else to describe it. It felt like I was on psychedelics and I wasn't, I was sober. It was just completely sober. And I had a very real sense of how God is rooted into all of us and how we're all part of the one. And I, 
it went on for like three hours. I had to call my father and he, I talked with him through this and I just felt like I was, I was receiving this open experience and for a while, and it was quite terrifying, actually. It was, mm. I thought, am I psychotic? You know, and I'm, and I think if you wanted to use diagnostic criteria to describe my state of mind, I was probably so maybe you could probably use diagnostic language to talk about that, but I don't see it that way. I didn't see it that way. And I felt like it profoundly changed my orientation towards my life and towards other people and towards God. And, and I don't really know how to make sense of all of that, but I am convicted of of the fact that we are part of something bigger, that we're all part of a one. And uh, I, I don't know what I think about modern religious language in order mm -hmm. to describe that. And I don't, I have tried, I've tried Christian churches my whole life and I haven't found one that feels like home to me. Um, I'm open to that. It might happen at some point, but at this point, I, I, uh, I think that there's more to us and I, yeah. And one of the things that I find so disturbing about social justice ideology is the cynicism and the willingness to throw away some lives for other lives and the, the, the sort of the, the decay of sexual morality, which mm -hmm. to me is about the loss of value of human life yeah, and human connection. Yes. And so this, that's part of that, that's part of this whole conversation to me. And I think it's, it's, so intricately woven into the conversation. And I have complete respect for where anybody is with that, be they atheist, be they fundamentalist, be they any religious perspective that a person has or no, none at all. I think that that's, it's an individual journey for each person to sort through and to figure out for themselves. But, um, but I am convinced that there's more to us and that what's so hurtful about these ideologies is that they're essentially anti-human and anti-life. I absolutely agree with you. And I, everything you're saying makes complete sense to me. And I had that, I had that moment too, where I realized the way you try to describe it, it, I understand it. Cause I had it. I know it sounds weird if people haven't had that <laughs> moment, but it was like that moment of feeling connected mm -hmm. to the source, to the creator, to mm -hmm. the one, mm -hmm. to what a lot of times people who are not Christian, but they want to talk about, they'll say the universe. I used to say the universe mm -hmm. and I know what people mean when they say that. I think mm -hmm. I think we're talking about the same thing when I mm -hmm. say God, mm -hmm. because I used to say the universe. But um, but yeah, that that now I kind of think of it as just such a beautiful. It's like God reaching down and touching you and opening your eyes to something that's not so easily seen in this material world. And I've had a few of those now. They're rare. But when they happen, it's just this overwhelming feeling of uh, there could be some terror there as well because mm -hmm. this is unusual. But the I'm try the last time this happened to me, it's this feeling of joy mm -hmm. and peace and knowing that everything's everything's happening. It's all known, but it, it's all happening and unfolding the way that God. He has his finger on it, I guess I'm saying, mm. that there's someone there who has us in the palm of his hand and that everything's going to be okay. Mm. And I, I don't know how to put it into words really either. It was sort of like uh, taking a, a step back and looking at not just my life and all the mistakes I've made and everything bad that's happened to me or everything bad I've done and just knowing that all of that is washed clean it's all okay hmm. it all makes sense i guess and for that and you're like i wish i i want to hold on to this understanding this feeling also because it's also a feeling of joy mm -hmm. and um sometimes i think that christianity if if you if especially if you're on the outside looking and you want to look at it like a drug or something it's chasing that high like <laughs> the, the jesus <laughs> of having another one of those moments you know but uh yeah, I I get what you're saying. That's I don't, so I don't... similar, yeah. and yet it's different. It's so <laughs> yeah. similar, and and yet for me at and in my in that final <laughs> experience, which I felt like I've had aftershocks of since, what was, I didn't I didn't have a sense of a design in the sense that there was God. Uh, and, and this is so this is so meandering and off the cuff. <laughs> We're doing okay. it on a recording, so okay. Um, <laughs> Um, I would love to talk with you more about this. I, um, I, 
had this this sense of the loneliness of the one. This was a profound thing and it was bigger than my brain could hold. It felt like it was a bigger yeah. feeling and a bigger awareness than my little human brain could manage. But it was this idea of the loneliness of the one and the creation of the many in order to experience connection. Mm. So this idea of, of, of God as a root that's in all of us, but all of us become our own creations and we're all pattern makers. We all create patterns that if they're going well, they pattern and spiral into other people's patterns and so that we connect. And so it's yeah. the experience and the bliss of reconnection that is the desire of God, the desire of God for things to connect back into into each other, to experience yeah. that. And I know I'm kind of like, repeating it because it's hard for me to articulate. It's really, I know it's a difficult concept, but it was, it was both profoundly sad to me and really, really beautiful. And it made yeah. me just appreciate the moments that we have this, this experience that we have and see. And I, when I came out of that, I felt like a fragile new baby. Like every single thing was a gift. This life was so beautiful and there was no taking any of it for granted. And, yes. and that stayed with me for quite a while. And then yes. it sort of faded, but, but that was such a profound experience and it, and it felt more real than just about anything. Yes. You're describing it well. Um, sadness and beauty. Mm -hmm. I would say in my case, sadness and joy. It's like every emotion together. It's hard to, mm -hmm. Sublime, I think. but it all makes sense. A, yeah, it's like, um, oh my gosh, I know how, I know people are going to be like, "What a weirdo!" <laughs> They're going to say the same about me. Yeah, but but I had this feeling in my heart that it that it is hard to put into words that it just everything everything checked out, everything made sense for a second, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like this sort of. It's okay. I could like, like God opens a little window so you can see like, Oh, you know, mm. <laughs> everything's fine. Um, all of this works together. I don't know. I've thought a lot since then about, about, um, well, I think about all kinds of things. I'm sure you too. I've thought about good and evil. Sometimes as a believer, I have, I, I come across the people who say things like, you know, how could there be a God when, who allows evil in the world? Mm -hmm. And, and that just blows my mind. That doesn't make sense to me because of course, of course there's evil in the world. Good, good wouldn't mean anything if there weren't evil in the world. They're defined in contrast to one another. Um, just like take anything, take your relationship with your spouse. Let's say you have a bad week or a bad month or, you know, a bad time period you go through. Then when you're having the good week and the good time and things are working well and you're really in sync and connecting, it means so much more because it's in relief to that dark time mm -hmm. and you value it more and appreciate it more and savor it more and you understand what it is because mm -hmm. of the, the mm -hmm. bad time. And so I, I never, I don't really understand that way of thinking. It seems very simplistic to me of like, mm -hmm. oh, if God were real, there'd be no evil. No. Also, we're not automatons. Mm -hmm. I think God wants us to have a relationship with him and with other humans and, mm -hmm. you know, with him and other humans, but by our own free will, he wants yeah. us to choose. Yeah. Not, he didn't, he's not going to create a bunch of robots, like worship me robots. You know, <laughs> you'll only know good and you'll only worship me. How would you do that if you were God? How boring. <laughs> like, well, that would, that would be right back to the loneliness of of yeah. only being one because it would be all predetermined. It would just be, it, there's no hope for the joy of connection if the connection is pre-programmed. Yes. Yeah. There's no hope for it because it, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean anything if they're programmed to worship you and <laughs> everything's good and they can't choose to do bad. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have a great, as humans, we have all of us, you know, that famous Alexander Solzhenitsyn quote, the line dividing good and evil runs down the heart of every man. That really when I first heard that, it really stood out to me. I thought about it for a long time. It's all, everyone has a capacity for good and evil. Um, as a, you know, since becoming a Christian, I've started to understand that as sometimes I think it's the same thing that Christians refer to as the spirit versus the flesh. Once you become a believer, you know, mm. 
and and um, some people who are not Christian refer to it as the soul versus the ego. But it's really that dividing line of the two parts of human nature. Mm -hmm. And some people who are who are not believers or are actually, I guess, some people who say they are, it's like they forget that they have that capacity for evil and that those people scare me. And a lot of woke people are like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of social justice people, they just, you know, you hear them say, I'm on the right side of history and this is about doing good. And, and because they think they have good ends and they're good people, they'll mm -hmm. justify it and they have no principles mm -hmm. or all the principles are flexible. They'll justify anything evil. They'll justify treating people differently on the basis of race. Mm -hmm. They'll justify physical violence. You know, they'll, they'll justify doxing people, canceling, trying to cancel people's businesses, anything mm -hmm. evil, mm -hmm. because they say, well, I'm good and my ends are good. They have a complete blindness to the darkness in their heart. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think that comes back to, in my way of thinking, content versus process or form versus substance, and that both are so important. You have to have your principle, but then the way that you, the way that you engage with that has to be in proper alignment. You can't allow yourself to become cynical and Machiavellian and let the ends justify the means. Right. Right. You can't let go of the process is a great way of putting it. Mm -hmm. It's like going to, I, I've, I've used this analogy before, but it works. So I'll use it again. It's, it's going to the gym. Mm -hmm. you, you can't just go one day and, and be like, Oh, I'm, I'm a physically fit person now. I never have to go back. <laughs> you have to go yeah. every day. <laughs> and, and I think it's similar with the way that we watch our own behavior and keep ourselves in check. Christianity, I think, you know, I was talking about this yesterday on my show, so it's on my mind, but it, it's the principles within Christianity. A lot of them seem to be common sense. When you start, when I started reading the Bible and the stuff Jesus said, I'm like, oh, okay. It's like, this is sort of a shortcut that I could have just read this and done this instead of learning everything the hard way. <laughs> like, like the things, you know, don't lie. These basic principles that I feel like it took me a lot of pain mm -hmm. and struggle to come back around to say, thinking some of these are true and important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, all of these are true and important. And, and so I've, I was reading that like, oh, these are, these are guiding principles. What if you view them instead of, instead of as restrictions from an authoritarian God who, who wants to restrict your fun, mm -hmm. they're actually like the fence posts that keep you in an area where you're going to be most joyful, most productive, most creative, happiest. Um, they're fence posts for your own protection mm -hmm. and good. Like mm -hmm. they're not, you know, it's not God trying to like harsh your fun, man. It's just, it's, it's like, you know, it's sort of a, 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 now I think of it as like, it's like a cliff notes for life. So you don't have mm -hmm. to learn all these things the hard way. Mm -hmm. The sexual immorality that you mentioned before being one, mm -hmm. I've, I've come to some realizations, whether you believe in God or not, I've started to understand, look, maybe sex before marriage isn't a great uh, thing to engage in, especially if you're a woman, because a lot of women end up in relationships with people who they wouldn't choose mm -hmm. as a life partner, mm -hmm. but they end up falling in love with them because they're having sex with them and they're bonding with them and they're releasing oxytocin, which is a bonding hormone, and they're mm -hmm. becoming attached to this person. And then they're in a, they're having kids with them and in a relationship with someone that's bad for them. And and so maybe that's not a, a great thing to do, to be promiscuous and, and sleep with lots of people and, and sort of bond with lots mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then look, oh, wait, the Bible says that? Okay. Mm. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like trying to protect me from that. Oh, yeah. got it. <laughs> that's been a big question for me is, you know, I, I consider this for better or for worse. And I would say for worse in some ways, although you know, I, I can always equivocate, but um, I, I consider it to be a post-religious society that we're living in right now. And whether something can spring back up and people can start to recognize some spiritual value, 
as a whole. I don't know that that's going to be in the direction of Christianity or in the direction of some other religion, or if it's just going to be unique experiences of, as you say, the universe and some spiritual value. I hope that that can happen. I hope that people can start to value life on a level beyond the material and however that looks. But, But we're in a society right now that has shaken off religious restraints for some time as as a culture we've moved away from this to the point where it's easy for the secular to ridicule the ridiculous or the 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 religious um mm-hmm. and to ridicule those kinds of um commandments and things like it's just crazy that you would suggest that women not have sex before marriage that's just that's just more people would find that crazy than find that reasonable and and so I, I guess I come back around to this question often: How do we, how do we negotiate or identify or develop a sense of sexual morality without a religious backing, without a religious framework? I don't know. I don't know if we can, mm-hmm. but I certainly, I'm aware that a lot of, a lot of people who might hear me speak on a interview like this or on my show or or people I meet out in the world, they probably don't share my religious beliefs. So I don't base things only in scripture um, because I want them to be able to hear what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And obviously for a lot of people who are inoculated against Christianity, like I was, um, they're not going to hear it. Or why would they? It's not their belief system. So who cares what the Bible says? They don't believe in it. So you can't ground it just in that. Like, we did, I've started doing every other week on, on Deprogrammed, we do a Christian panel. It's called That Christian Panel. Mm-hmm. And then it's me and um, some other YouTubers, some from the cultural, like uh, Friday Night Tights, nerdrotic space, like Odin from Odin's movie movie reviews and um, Michelle from Force of Light and Brahma Bull. And then we have guests like Gothics and other, but it's a place for people who do podcasts or do YouTube and to come and talk about Christianity and maybe they don't do that on their channel. That's not the point of their channel. Maybe Mm -hmm. they're game reviewers or Mm -hmm. entertainment reviewers. And so we have these conversations. We just did one about porn, the problem with porn. Mm -hmm. Now we're all Christians. So we are talking about it from a Christian perspective and we are bringing up scripture, but that wasn't the majority of what we focused on. We Mm -hmm. talked about real world stuff. We talked about the fact that porn addiction causes ED even mm-hmm. in young men, we, we looked mm-hmm. at statistics of increasing rates of erectile dysfunction in young men, which we didn't used to see. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about the way it ruins relationships. And and we looked at statistics of relationship satisfaction among men who consume a lot of porn and men who don't. Mm-hmm. Um, we looked at, like I talked about uh, before, I often talk about the, the bonding chemical, mm-hmm. the oxytocin and, mm-hmm. and sex and how um that's maybe one reason not to be promiscuous i don't think we talked about that in the porn episode but my point is we talked about the real world Mm -hmm. the things in the material world the things in your personal life that could be affected by being a consumer of porn Mm -hmm. and without just basing it in scripture it's sort of like you take the scripture but you can see all these the scripture i as a christian i believe it's there for a reason why does it why does it um encourage us to stay away from sexual immorality because sexual immorality has so many negative effects on us as people, on our families and on society. And so you can go and look at all those effects and talk about those. You don't have to just talk about Mm -hmm. the scripture. I don't know if that's answering your question. No, it totally, it's, it's really interesting because it's like the scripture in this paradigm is like mom saying, because I said so. Mm-hmm. And then there's the kid who needs to go figure it out for themselves. Why? Yeah, yeah. why? I need to understand this. Leslie, this is, I am one of those kids who you, you know, some kids, supposedly you can tell them don't touch a hot stove and they'll listen to you and they won't touch it. Yeah. I'm the kid who has to touch the hot stove to learn <laughs> why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I understand that completely. Yeah. No, it's, uh, there's a really good book that I just, um, I read it and then I asked my solid ground co-hosts to read it as well. And it's called your brain on porn by Gary Wilson. 
And it goes into a lot of this, uh, a lot of the research on what porn does to users and talks about the physical dysfunction that it creates and the relational dysfunction. And it's full, it's just full of um, testimonials too, from men who have tried to get off porn or have successfully gotten off porn is really good. And we are in the middle of a two-part series on that. We just did part one, two weeks ago, we're doing part two on Monday. So we're recording and talking about I'm that. I'm definitely going to watch that because I, I, I want to read the book uh, because yeah. I think this is one of the biggest problems affecting the family, therefore yeah. affecting culture at the moment. And it's in the church. We looked at the stats of pastors, Christian pastors who say they use porn. It was oh my gosh, crazy. Oh my gosh. It was gosh. like yeah. over 50% or something. Wow. It was something insane. Yeah. It's infecting the church. And, and my pastor had a great um, sermon about this. He's like, no wonder you mm -hmm. don't see more of the pastors standing up to this cultural decline, being brave right, right. and going out there and standing against things like mutilating surgeries on kids yeah. and things because they're enfeebled by yeah. their own secret sin. Right. And, and wow, that hit me. It's like, yes, you've become a coward because you've got this thing that you're dealing with. If you're a Christian and you have a porn addiction that you're not willing to get help for or tell people about, or you think it's okay, or you can keep it under wraps. And it's like, no, mm -hmm. I, one of the things I, I forgot to mention, and I'm sure it's in that book is that Porn addiction causes escalation, like any drug yes. addiction. So people seek out more taboo, more mm -hmm. hardcore, mm -hmm. more extreme, and more of it in order to be able to get off. And like, no wonder they can't get off with their partner anymore. Yeah, uh, yes, absolutely. And it's <laughs> and it's crazy. They've even got, there was an interview not that long ago with some porn producer who intentionally tries to inject more trans themes into porn yes. in order to, uh, you know, it's the same th sort of thing. We're trying to influence the young people to think a different way. And he's talking about presenting porn for the 13 year old. I mean, he's talking oh. about this audience of young people that needs to see this kind of thing. I think that oh. 13 and I'm, I've got a 12 year old son. I, it breaks my heart to think about somebody trying to show him this kind of material. I mean, it's just disgusting. It's but soul destroying. It is. And, and, and it's really interesting when you think about cultural engineering in this particular sphere. We, I actually reached out to the author of this book in order to see if he would come on and speak with us. And he actually passed away a couple of years ago, but his team still runs the website. And they anonymously replied to me and said that there was nobody who would be willing to talk about this. And then they sent me a bunch of links to, uh, to actual uh, papers that have been written about the smear campaign that was done against this man by the porn industry. And they, wow. they altered the way back machine to try to destroy his character. And, and Evil. just, uh, yeah, it and, and I just thought that's really, it's bizarre to me that there would be that kind of investment in this. Isn't this an industry that like they're, the substance that they're selling is so inherently interesting and addictive to people? Why would they also need to manipulate? Why would they need that? And it, it just, it was very interesting. Um, it's evil. And it's, it's a strange, it, yeah, I do think it's at the root of a lot of issues. Somebody I was just speaking with was saying it was, it's directly involved in, um, how did he put it? He put it so simply. It was just uh, pair bonding. He just said, this is how we undermine pair bonding, which is how yeah. we undermine the family and on Everything. and on. Everything. Yeah. I've, I've had people, because I, I sometimes write about or talk about um, being an alcoholic and getting sober. Um, and I've had people write me about their all different kinds of addictions. Mm -hmm. And I've had people write me about their porn addiction mm -hmm. and telling me it's, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. It's coming mm -hmm. between me and my wife mm -hmm. and, you know, looking for help and society. It's weird porn. Unlike a lot of other addictions, people get really angry. If you talk about it, I don't know if people react that way to any, they definitely don't react that way if you talk about gambling or alcohol or, but, you know, even just tweeting about our show, we got tons of defensive, angry people. Somebody in the comments implored people to drop their favorite porn scene in my comments just by saying, hey, we're going to do a show oh my gosh, on the problems yeah. of porn. Here's the link if you want to join. Drop porn in her comments, you know, just hateful and yeah. evil. 
like they, why they're it's so held defensive. very close to them it's almost like it's egocentric it's yeah. like they can't they can't see that as being something separate from themselves it's it rots wow. you yeah. that there i'm sure you've come across it but uh if you're doing this research and reading this book but um and you mentioned the the trans stuff being dropped in porn there's this whole new genre i think it's the most dangerous genre of porn it's called sissy porn i've heard and of that the yeah. intent of it is to turn straight men into, into trans women. Yeah, yeah. And it's not like any other porn. It's not like a storyline or people coming in. It's, uh, you know, ah, the plumber's here and then, you know, sex <laughs> happens. It's it, it doesn't even have a storyline. It's just it's hypnotic flashing scenes mm. and um, phrases being flashed on the screen while you see these trans women or, you know, men dressed as women having sex with men and there's things flashing on the screen that say, you know, become a bimbo, uh, become oh, wow. a whore, you know, you want to like, it's, it's the, all, the wow. whole aim of it is to get you. I think it, I think it actually, a lot of the men who are now coming out as trans, not all of them, but some of them are directly, there is a direct link between consuming this kind of porn, getting more and more extreme, mm -hmm. getting into watching tranny porn, and then getting to the place of that's not getting me off anymore. Now I have to become a tranny. Yeah. And um, wow. I, I speculate about some of the ones who've come out that I think are more, um, they don't really have gender dysphoria. They're more it's like autogynophiles. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. some of them I know watched this porn because they talked about it. It's like, wow. Okay. Um, Anyway, I'm sorry. That may be, I'm going to get your video pulled down now. No, it's okay. <laughs> I, it's okay. It's, it, I think it's a really important topic, even if it, I'm not going to stop talking about it. I think it's really important. And I two think, more, uh, yeah, I, go ahead. I know go ahead. it sounds like yeah. it wraps. So two more things on this topic real quick. Yeah. I did a series of videos on Bubba Copeland. If, if people are interested in this is. topic, yeah. he's a pastor and mayor in the small town in Alabama who got really into this sissy porn, started secretly while he's preaching every Sunday, started writing murder porn about women he knew, had this secret life, dressing like a woman and going on the internet, taking photos of children in his town, making porn, oh graphic sissy porn stuff with them, putting it oh online, no. ultimately ended his own life. But the mainstream media ran with this story, completely false story. They left out all the the uh, the his victims, everything he was doing to people. They ran this story like, you know, sad uh, case of a trans woman being bullied to death by it's like, what are you oh, talking wow. about? He didn't even identify as a trans. But his story, if you really get deep into it, is about what, in my opinion, the corrupting nature of porn and what it can do to a life and a family. And so I would look, if you're interested in this topic, look up yeah. Baba Copeland and, um, oh, and the other thing was just, is there a anecdote. good resource for that? Is there like a podcast or a, a book or a, uh, you can watch one of my videos about it on okay. Deep Programmed. Do you have, you a, up, if you send me yeah, a link, I'll put, I'll put it on it the, below. the, uh, description, but in terms of the best coverage, Redux magazine, the feminist site, okay. they did the best coverage and there was a right wing site that also covered it. I think it was sixteen nineteen news, hmm. not seven. Some it's there's a number in there. I forget the number. Anyway, <laughs> go to Redux. You'll find it. Okay. And it, it took like a month for the New York Times to finally do somewhat accurate reporting on it. There was a local TV station that talked to some of the victims that covered it accurately, but and for the most part, all of the mainstream news was just trying to turn this guy into some hero after the fact. And when you actually huh. dove into it and looked at the stuff that had been uncovered, you're like, this wow. guy, if were he still alive, you know, they could press charges against him for what he was doing mm -hmm. online with their images and stuff. And um, but but really it just yes, this is a pastor wow. that this happened to. And yeah. and so look that story up. The other thing I was gonna say is Reddit. Sometimes I go on Reddit and I look at the forums to see what people are talking about. I want to get the pulse of what's going on in the world. It is a dark, no. dark, sad yeah. place. Yeah. And if you go to the relationship advice forum and you scroll through, it's page after page of porn addiction problems. Mm -hmm. Almost every problem. It might start off as something else like my husband and I are having this problem, da, 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 da. And you start reading the details and then it, there it is. It comes and down to porn. also porn addiction. Yeah. I'm like, it's the root of so many of these problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that it's really, I think it's 
uh, I've been saying that for a while. I think it's an epidemic that is people don't want to talk about it, but the more you look, the more you find it. Yeah. Yeah. It's really important. And to, you know, the example of, of um, how there was something from that, your brain on porn book where he talked about animal studies where they, they got, they in uh, sort of developed fetishes in rats by pairing even an unpleasant stimulus. So they took rats that um, uh, male rats and put them in a uh, grouping with females that were sexually receptive and they rubbed some of the females with uh, the smell of death. And so the males would stay away from them and mate with the females that didn't smell like death. But if they, they, were only exposed to females that also had the smell of death on them, they would overcome their repulsion and they would mate with those. And eventually with enough pairings, they would get aroused by the smell of death. Oh my God. And so it's that sort of conditioning process that, you know, it sounds like that sissy porn you're talking about. You condition someone through repeated pairings and eventually that thing itself, the, 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 the stimulus that is being paired can elicit that same response. Yeah. And it's, it's really fascinating the brain science behind this. And I think that, like you said, you have this Christian panel that you address it, but you don't need the Christian framework in order to talk about this in a meaningful way. And I think that's, what's really important. We can, it's very easy for people to shrug off the moralizing, but you don't have to moralize to demonstrate that this stuff is harmful. Yes. Correct. Yeah. I thought I was going to talk to you about deprogramming uh, <laughs> from cults. And I was going to ask you about your comedy uh, past and all these other things. And we ended up talking about Jesus and porn, but it's been <laughs> rat. That's sad, one of the saddest things I've heard yeah. all week. The I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, gosh. oh, man. Uh, no, this was this is great talking to you, Leslie. Thank you for having yeah, I me. Feel I, like talk, I feel like I could talk to you about anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. I do too. Thank you so much. <laughs> I feel like we need a palate cleanser after the rat thing. So um, what are you excited about that you're working on right now? And <laughs> and and where, where can people follow you and what are your recommendations? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, you can follow me at D Program with Carrie Smith on any platform. I think my handle is real Carrie Smith on almost everything now, K-E-R-I. Um, and what's coming up? Um, well, if you're in the Austin, Texas area, Minds Fest is coming back to Austin. I uh, hosted last year at the Vulcan. And it was the first one in Texas and it was phenomenal. We we had all kinds of speakers this year. They have, um, I'm going to be moderating some panels and they have uh, Alex, they have Alex Stein, Jimmy Dore, oh, he's, he's interesting, <laughs> Ian Crossland, uh, Shane Cashman, Luke Radowski. There's a lot of Tim Cast people, um, Ashley St. Clair, Lauren Chen. Anyway, if you want to come hear some of these speakers debate each other, have discussions on panels, and there's also going to be comedy. It's going to be Saturday, April 27th at the Vulcan mm. in Austin, Texas. And uh, you can get tickets at, you can go to the Minds platform and look up Minds Fest to get tickets. You said um, Saturday, April 27th? Yes. Okay. And then on my channel, uh, well, my husband and I were renovating, we're renovating this old house slowly. And this studio took us 10 weeks. We're finally done with it. So I'm very excited because now I have a finished space and I'm going to be doing more in-person interviews, um, again, with the intention of just helping people to better understand what social justice ideology is and why it's a bad thing, why I think it's a bad thing. And I'll be doing more in-person interviews. Um, plus we're doing, as I mentioned, this new Christian panel every two weeks, which I really love. It's it's one of my favorite things right now is just hanging out with, uh, and, and it's, and it's like a safe space where it's safe to be a weirdo Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, we have non-believers who watch as well. It's fine. You can come in the chat. It's okay. <laughs> um, and then, uh, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, where it, if you are in the area, I live halfway between Austin and Waco. I live near Georgetown, Texas. If you're in the area, my husband's a musician. We do house concerts and I've had several people come who I met through my podcast. If you're in the area and you want to come, we're getting ready to do the first one of 2024 in March and just email me at dprogrampod at gmail.com. We sell about 50 tickets to these. 
it's in our home. So we only send it to people, the ticket link to people who ask who we, who we've, we just want to make sure we don't put the link out there publicly. Yeah. And, yeah. um, it's so fun. It's like a little salon. We have different theme for each show. So he brings in all these talented musicians from all over and each show is different. And, um, yeah, you can come. That's all. They're, they're always a lot of fun. So that sounds yeah. awesome. That sounds like so much fun. <laughs> it is. People bring casseroles and stuff. It's... <laughs> That's really cool. And it's yeah. kind of gutsy putting yourself out there, but I, I suppose you have some kind of vetting process. Yes. It's very secure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it needs to be better. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try to get in, evildoers. We've got you. I'm making sure there's security. <laughs> no, there, there will be eventually, I'm sure. Oh my um, goodness. Yeah. No, that's awesome. <laughs> well, I have really enjoyed just talking with you, Carrie. Thank you for doing this. And we went a lot longer than I thought we would, but thank you for taking the time. Oh, it's fine. I love meeting you and congratulations yeah. on everything on your wedding. And oh. so nice to meet you. And I, I hope I get to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. I do yeah. too. <laughs>